Hello and welcome to Solving Climate Change Once and For All. I'm Bi Hui Ye, and thank you so much for joining this online series where we're speaking to experts and entrepreneurs to learn what from their work we can apply to climate action and more importantly to climate justice. You'll leave with the number one thing that you can do to make a positive impact. Today, I am so delighted to be joined by Lauren Oak, award-winning author of In Search of the Canary Tree, Professor of Earth Sciences at Stanford, and Ecologist Extraordinaire. Thanks so much for joining us, Lauren. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for putting this together. Wonderful. So I love going back to the beginning and understanding people's initial inspiration for their current work. Can you share what sparked your interest in environmental issues and kind of that tipping point to go into science and writing more? Well, I usually say as, as long as I can remember, I've always been captivated, intrigued, and concerned about environmental issues. Um, my dad gave me this old retina camera, you know, the kind that you'd open the door and it unfolds. Um, I think it was from the 1960s or so. It was his grandfather's. Um, my grandfather's. <clears throat> Anyhow, he gave it to me when I was in my early teens, and the earliest contact sheets and things that I photographed were fill were were of um, trees that had been trimmed and cut and shaped in different ways, and landscapes in my backyard and around where I grew up that I noticed were changing. Um, so I, I think early on I felt this kind of innate fascination, and you know, over time, you know, that kind of sparked learning more about the kind of land use changes occurring in even in high school mm -hmm. and uh i'd say by the time i went to college i was um full set on you know diving into environmental studies and kind of and pairing that with storytelling so i um i went to brown and i i studied environmental issues and then also um was doing a lot of, of photography and film at the time that's so awesome i love the artist inspiration in your background that kind of took you down this path. Was there sort of a tipping point when you connected that love of trees to more of the climate change systemic um, subject matter that you do more work in now? Yeah, so I worked throughout my 20s uh, in, you know, after college um, in advocacy, working with various NGOs and you know, still kind of, and, and working directly on environmental issues. But I think what I learned from that, I was often you know working with community members or stakeholders affected by an issue, the scientists who were understanding them, and then trying to you know influence the policy that that could make a difference. And I felt like in that journey, you know, I was still photographing. I worked on a couple films during that time. Um, I was also involved in research projects. Uh, I felt like I the there's maybe three things that really affect change and it's the understanding that the problem, the research that goes into it, the policymaking to make, to do something differently and the storytelling that kind of bridges between that understanding and action. And I felt like science was kind of this black box. <laughs> and so that was the last black box for me. And so um, I, I left my work uh, with an NGO at the time and, and went to Stanford. I went to the Emmett interdisciplinary program in environment and resources. And it is a, a applied program where uh, it's really geared towards environmental problem solving where there are often people have been out, you know, doing similar work to what I was doing, really on the ground work addressing environmental problems. And then you're coming back to bridge between different disciplines to, 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 to help solve them. And at, when I started my PhD, I actually thought I was, uh, I was actually working on a project in the Amazon, um, kind of at the arc of deforestation where at that time and, you know, still today, there's obviously lots of land use change and, and, and threats to intact systems. Um, when I spent a summer there. Uh, and something about that highlighted for me, well, that there was another level coming, that you know, the, uh, the, the effects of deforestation, the effects of deforestation was profound and on the local environment and the people there. And, and then you know, I knew that would extend further in terms of the climate effects. And so that's kind of really what, what sparked my interest in working on climate change directly. What an amazing intersection and kind of being able to bring it all together. We know that climate change is so systemic and interconnected, so it's awesome to see your art, research, and writing kind of come together to be able to tackle and create those solutions. So thanks for sharing that. 
Yeah. Something yeah. that I've seen in the course of my career, which has largely been focused on energy as a lever to help with climate change mitigation and solutions, is this huge oversight in terms of the social justice aspect of the work that we're doing and where the resources are going. It's really kind of focused on technology or financing and innovation, and it's kind of missing this aspect of climate justice. If we don't solve it for everybody, we aren't solving it. And that's the central topic of this series. Um, and, and I'm curious from your kind of very interdisciplinary perspective, how do you define climate justice? And then why is it so often overlooked? Yeah, great question. I think kind of in the, in the public arena and media, climate justice is often portrayed as, you know, the framing on global warming that is, you know, more focused on the ethical and political issues rather than purely the biophysical of, or the environmental of what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, but I think for me personally, uh, and in terms of what I've witnessed in the communities where I work, it strikes a chord on the, on the, the inequities that this issue creates, the inequity it creates, the inequitable impacts from it, and the uh, vulnerability of some populations more than others. And, and when I say vulnerability, I think of that in terms of, well, I'm gonna say social ecological system, which is a super nerdy term, but <laughs> <laughs> um, both in terms of, you know, the really all life, you know, the yeah. human humanity, um, but also, you know, in the case, of the forests where I was working, there were certainly um, differential impacts to to tree species that were impacted mm -hmm. more than others, and those ultimately trickle down to people. So there's a there's inequities across the all forms of life. Yeah, and I think what's interesting is that, and something a lot of our listeners will probably understand and have experienced is that when you're dealing with these sorts of issues and you're doing work in these holistic crises, right? Climate, it's so interconnected. You're dealing with so many different facets. Even in your work, you're dealing with research and writing and activism and storytelling. I'm curious how you would share how you prioritize when everything seems urgent and important. Yeah. You know, what's the mechanism to deal with that? Where do you begin? Um, and how you make sure that that work is also being shared in an inclusive manner. So again, back to yeah. how do we bring this to more people and more people that need to hear it rather than just a majority? Sure, great question. There's a lot in there. I think on a, on first to just to kind of address the various aspects of the work I do, I mean, I kind of think of it as like a dance now and sometimes I'm doing one more than the other. And, um, you know, I told, I, there's been probably three times in my life where I debated, should I have gone to journalism school? Or, <laughs> and then I just remind myself, no, just write about the things that I'm engaged in and the things that I know about and the things that my work is exposing me to because of the fact that I get to, you know, and I want to work in some of these places that are really experiencing some of the, the most dramatic impacts already. Mm. Um, so it is kind of a dance. And um, in terms of how do I gauge it and how do I decide, you know, where to put my energy? I mean, part of what I find inspiring about this issue is there are so there's so much we can do and so when I start my day I don't have this feeling of um you know bleak outlook it's more about we've got this massive problem and there's so many different pieces to work on so you know what what's the one I'm going to pick on what's what's one I'm going to work on today mm. um I do think of across time scales so you know um like working on a project that I think about what kinds of outcomes it'll have in the short term and also longer term. And I think that's also what helps me and what inspires me to do more popular writing about the work. Um, because I think that, you know, the more that people can be informed about um, the impacts occurring, some of the solutions that people are, people are finding like that raises awareness and that, you know, potentially increases the number of people engaged on this issue. Um, so yeah, where am I in the dance right now? I have a research project going on where we're assessing, um, we're taking a, ten year, a look at 10 years of adaptation projects that have already been funded and completed and trying to look at what were some of the aspects of these projects that led to kind of the best outcomes. And that type of research can you know, help inform 
other adaptation efforts. So it's really applied. Um, I don't think of it as just you know research for for curiosity's sake. I think of it as problem solving research. And then I'm starting to work on a on a new book uh, around the topic of natural climate solutions because I feel like that's one that's um, you know has been overlooked a lot. Absolutely, yeah. And to your earlier point about science being a black box, right? How are you able to as you uncover this and you have access to this work, you're leading the research, you come across these insights, how are you thinking about making sure it's getting, the stories are being told to broader audiences, to people that might not have you know, heard it or read it in their normal sphere of news? Mm -hmm. I think it's a really hard thing to measure in terms of, in terms of, of reach. Um, Although I was surprised to see, you know, just, you know, hits to the site where I host information about my book and seeing the number of countries of people that are, you know, have been um, digging into this issue in Southeast Alaska just blew my mind. Awesome. It was upwards of 100 countries around. Um, but I think, I mean, the question you're raising is also about voice right like what news outlets are you going to what reach does that have what's their readership mm -hmm. um but then also the voice uh we give to we try to give to people and that i try to represent in my work of others um that are impacted elizabeth rush for example did a great book called rising and she did a really good job i think of narrating um, bringing her narrative to the issue of, of sea level rise and coastal erosion but then going to people in impact in communities that have been impacted by it. And, you know, the book weaves between her voice and the, and the voice of other, um, uh, others that have been impacted that just start to drive the narrative. And I think that's a really ex good example of um, starting to bring to light, you know, the stories of, of people experiencing the impacts as well as those leading the solutions without, you know, it being kind of a, a narrative that someone else is directing. Um, so that, that's definitely inspired me in some of the work that I'm thinking about doing now and, and trying to tackle. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's an awesome point of inspiration and definitely one that people can take and turn into their own well of energy to, you know, understand who is tackling with problems in which way that might be different from your own, breaking down echo chambers and trying to hear more diversity in the dimensions of this crisis that we're working through. Um, I think maybe I'd also just say that there's so many different outlets now for, for, for increasing the conversation on this, on this topic and whether that's, you know, a top media outlet or a blog or, um, you know, a conversation in your hometown or writing in your local paper about a project you're doing. Um, I think that all of those endeavors are worthwhile and the more that we can get, those stories coming from the people doing that work, the more, you know, accessible and personally relatable it is and, you know, feels authentic in that way. Yeah, great point. It, it's really about more voices to get the diversity, right, versus the same sort of talking heads or people who are um, telling us the same narrative as well. So mm -hmm. that's very helpful. I think uh, turning our attention to the work that you did in In Search of the Canary Tree Something that really resonated with me in terms of a parallel between that conservation work and climate change in general is dealing with grief, right? Dealing with grief and um, helping to, to find solutions for climate change, for climate justice. They're both kind of invisible problems. They're heavy by nature. People can deprioritize them as we have competition for our limited attention. Um, what, what lessons can you kind of share from your work exploring the loss and grief of um, what you observed and that you would then kind of share with our listeners who might be going through some of that themselves? Oh, the research I was doing was uh, kind of a combined social and ecological study. And so I was working in Southeast Alaska, um, which is a coastal temperate rainforest. Um, and there's a tree species there, yellow cedar, um, Calotropsis nucatensis, that's, that's dying because of climate change. Um, and, you know, for, for listeners or people who have visited the, you know, redwoods in California, 
Um, it's a it's a relative of this magnificent mm-hmm. tree that many people know, and it is really iconic in the landscape as well as you know valued in the culture. It's also the most one of the most economically valuable tree species in terms of its wood quality. So it's really got an economic driver behind its you know material use. Um, and so I was looking to understand, um, you know, once these trees die, how does the rest of the forest community develop? And then also how are people coping with those changes in their community? And when I went into it as a researcher, I was thinking about largely their direct uses, you know, ways yeah. in which people were harvesting the trees and how was the export affected? How was the industry affected? How was land use affected? Um, but what emerged also was this whole dimension of psychological coping that, um, you know, people who were using the trees either for their material use or even, you know, non-use, a non-direct or indirect use, like recreation or cultural, were experiencing a lot of grief around the loss of the species. Um, and that's really where the canary in the coal mine came in because um, the people who were most knowledgeable about this dieback being caused by by climate change were you know, experiencing this grief process, but also many of them were taking actions to address the global problem. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, educating others about climate change, trying to reduce their home energy use. And it was as if understanding, you know, this massive, seemingly remote, distant, far off issue, experiencing those impacts in place was kind of the awakener to, to the larger issue itself. Um, and I'd say the same happened to me through my research that, you know, yes, I spent six years in a forest ecosystem and in, you know, remote communities studying this, this, this species in this forest, but it's also represented what's happening in many other places in the world. Um, and, uh, I think that as we start to see more impacts occurring, that's the awakening that, that we all need to have is that this is an issue that affects us all. Um, we're all a part of the problem, but we're all also can be a part of the solution too. And that's a lot where I've, you know, placed my energy and, and focused now in my year since then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very cool backstory in terms of the inspiration for the title and, uh, an invitation for everybody to see what is their canary in the coal mine to kind of create that personal connection back to why should I care? Why do I care? And what can I do about this, right? Um, Which we'll get to later in our conversation. I think one other aspect of your work, which is really interesting to share with folks is from kind of your conservation work hat, right? Particularly in natural climate solutions. um, There's a lot of discussion about mitigation of climate change impacts. How do we decrease emissions? How do we keep global warming to less than two degrees? Um, We've talked about adaptation as kind of a corollary of that and how we shift the conversation from mitigation to adaptation. Uh, Can you share a little bit more about the work that you've done there and kind of what we should be thinking about in that shift from stopping and changing our behaviors to more adapting to what has already changed. Yeah, I don't even know if it's a shift. It's more about both. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, you know, in the early 2000s, Al Gore was someone, you know, out front, you know, kind of calling attention to to climate change. And at that time, adaptation was thought of as a failure. It was as if, okay, if we can't stop emissions and we can't stop this climate change issue, then we should start dealing with, well, what do we do with it? And what do we do with the impacts? Right. But, um, you know, even if we stopped all emissions today, we still have a, a backlog due to lag times coming down the pipe of, of impacts. And so, you know, this, this is affecting so many things in our local communities that, you know, function on a day-to-day basis, whether you're talking about like a, a real practical example is the timing of, plant, of, of planting for crops, you know, that's mm-hmm. shifting earlier with the earlier seasons. Um, those types of impacts have real uh, effects for communities and, you know, require the adaptation too to, to change their behaviors alongside. But I think it gets kind of mixed up in the public eye because we think of, okay, what's climate action? Well, climate action is stopping this problem, but climate action is also, yes, is, is reducing, finding ways to reduce our emissions, but also finding ways to be more resilient to the 
you know, the, the warming conditions and all the other impacts associated with that. Um, so, so since then, and some of the work that I've been doing, um, this is kind of the natural climate solution space where, um, you know, intact ecosystems as well as, you know, natural ecosystems we work to restore can offer mitigation benefits, enormous mitigation benefits, um, but also, you know, in some ways they're our best defense against, against climate change. So mangroves, for example, um, are really effective at buffering communities from flooding and coastal inundation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, investing in protecting mangroves in, in, strategic, in strategic places or um, doing restoration type activities, um, you know, prove to uh, be, offer a greater return on investment than the kinds of infrastructure solutions that we think about. They are more resilient to the future climate. Um, so that's some of the the work that I've been involved in in terms of funding through the Climate Adaptation Fund, um, and then also in, in terms of research to try and get more awareness for this, this topic. Um, they say that natural climate solutions can be about 30% of the mitigation solution, but they're only getting about, you know, five to 6% of the, the conversation and less than that in terms of the investment dollars. Wow. Yeah, and I think there's, there's a lot of these little pockets of solutions or action that are hidden in, you know, the different aspects and dimensions of what we can do in terms of climate action, climate justice. So that's really cool to uncover and unpack a little bit for us. Um, one other aspect of your work that has been enlightening for me to hear as we talk about adaptation mitigation at the foundation of it is individuals right it's individuals and I think how you personalize that relationship back to what can each of us do why why do we care um, and you've shared about the human relationship that people can have with the earth with resources can you talk a little bit more about um, thinking of nature in the paradigm of resourcing from nature versus changing that to having a relationship with nature? Yeah, great question. So this came out of um, one of the interviews I did in my research in Southeast Alaska, and I wrote about it in In Search of the Canary Tree. tree. But um, I met uh, Terry Rufgar, who's a Klinkit woman who, uh, used to live, she has since passed away, in, in Sitka. And she posed the idea to me that, you know, what if in every context we're using resource, so natural resource management, resourcing from, um, we change that framing to think about uh, a relationship with nature. And, you know, it's funny when I was writing it and trying to express the narrative in the book, um, I felt like, oh, this could be read as this like extreme kind of tree hugging left is green. <laughs> but there's actually something um, yeah, really concrete about it that has helped me um, think of sustainability in a, in a more tangible way. I think also think sustainability is a term that's is somewhat nebulous or there's lots of definitions put to it, but we have different interpretations of what is sustainable. Mm -hmm. But the idea is, you know, that when you resource something, it's directional. You're taking from, you're taking from something else. And in some ways it denies that there's a relationship or that there's a, you know, feedback between the two. Mm -hmm. And a relationship in contrast, you know, if a, is, is something that requires care for one another. And, you know, Terry was wise to point out that in any relationship we hit low points and challenges and moments where we're thinking like, can we fix this? Can we, um, what is the option here? How are we going to get out of this or how are we going to get back to, or how are we going to rebuild? Yeah. Um, and I think it's the same context here that, you know, if you apply that to the natural world, you're inherently recognizing that people rely upon nature and, and, um, we need to figure out the sustainable ways to keep, take, to take care of it, to, to in some ways get the services, the services that we need to survive. Yeah, I think that's such an important mental judo flip. And we know that words matter. And what an interesting, simple exercise to just ask yourself this question of, is it a resource or is it a relationship? And as we're filming this amidst COVID-19's global pandemic, 
we know we are going to live in a future, in a current state too, of having to deal with these pandemics, right? With these mm -hmm. viruses. And so how do we wanna continue living, moving forward? Um, what serves us, what doesn't? How do we have a relationship with it versus thinking it'll all go back to normal and we can move on from there? So that's a really powerful example and kind of exercise to change the thinking there. For sure. And it's kind of like a window into what happens when we stand still, right? That, you know, I read a number of articles about air pollution in China and Italy down and, um, you know, certain um, uh, populations seen in canals of waterways that haven't been there before. And, you know, I don't think that our existence of shelter in place is one that's sustainable for the future by any means either. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, in some ways it's given us a window into what that looks like and how the, the, that allows some systems to recover a bit and you know I think it's a good practice and I'm hopeful that you know our leaders will thoroughly embrace it moving forward is that you know when we look at what is a recovery plan from this pandemic how does that include um, you know solutions that also benefit our climate system because that's what's coming next too yeah definitely so we promised our listeners the number one takeaway that they can have in order to direct their energy and, and do something about climate justice. From all your research, from all your insight, you've clearly thought about this a lot. How would you boil it down for our audience? Yeah, great question. Everybody always wants to know, what can I do? <laughs> yeah. And I think I like to start with that. Um, no one is going to, no one is going to save the world on, on their own. Right. Um, and so I think I'm okay with scaling back on a daily basis and saying, what, what can I do to be a part of the solution? But I think some of the key points I highlight is that, you know, in recent years, public perception of climate change as a risk and a concern has been um, changing for sure and improving. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot more people, largest, the large, larger portion of the U S um, irrespective of political party, you know, sees this as a problem we need to address. Right. Um, so that's a step in a, in a great direction that's happened just in recent years. I think we need to continue to elevate that conversation and we're all a part of that and the conversations we hold in our communities and our families, um, in our jobs. Um, I think that, you know, there's also another parallel to the pandemic in that, by staying home right now, we're all playing a part, some small part in helping this enormous battle, but we also need a massive coordinated action and leadership from our governments. Um, and I think the same is true for climate change, that each one of us can ask, um, you know, what's within my realm? What's my starting point? What can I act on both on the adaptation and mitigation side, but then recognize that Part of that also needs to include, you know, putting pressure and asking for support from our leaders because we're going to need that too. And I think, you know, Naomi Klein made a good, great point. This changes everything was the was the paradigm for the climate change. But I also think it's the same for the, the pandemic. Um, they're both issues that uh, unite people because they're affecting us all. And so to me, we all need to play a a part of the solution and that may be what one considers a small role or you know if you're a head of a company and you have a some decision making that where you can consider other externalities you don't typically consider like that's a decision you're also empowered to make absolutely and i think that already preempts the follow-up question that i like to ask because yes everybody wants to know what is it that i can do but part of that baked into that is what can we create pressure on our institutions and governments and corporations to do because you can't do it alone. And when it's so systemic and baked into our society and the way that we live our lives and run our um, societies, it's, it's impossible to take that all upon yourself, right? Mm -hmm. so in uh, wrapping up, I think that you've had the benefit of thinking about this at a much deeper level than many of us, you know, from the research angle, from the um, science angle, and turning that into engaging narratives and stories for people to benefit from and start caring about. 
Are there any kind of final gems you want to share with our viewers, you know, an aha moment in your career that you'd like to share? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I definitely want to address that. And I also want to add to your question about just like the scaling up, right? Absolutely. And just thinking a little bit more about, you know, what we each can do, but also how we put pressure on, on our leaders and, and where can that motivation come from, come from, from more, you know, governmental leadership. Right. Um, and I think the biggest thing I often highlight there is that climate action is often thought of as, you know, giving something up or, um, upending the economic system. But I think that a lot of the long-term economic investments that we can make in natural climate solutions and other, in, in the broad portfolio of solutions needed, um, you know, offer more benefits uh, and a greater return on investment. Mm -hmm. So I think the, um, the Global Commission on Adaptation, um, which is led by uh, Ban Ki-moon and Bill Gates, um, or, or there are at least two of the leaders, uh, really highlighted that in, in 2019, that um, there's a lot of potential to, for a great return on investment for these types of actions. And if we can start seeing it as an opportunity and not a loss, um, I think that's where we can get more leadership as well. Right. And I guess that points to the aha moment as well, because um, climate, to, to a large extent, research has focused on the negative impacts, right? To mm -hmm. looking for where we're seeing losses. And, you know, that's certainly where I have also felt personally grief um, to, to experience those and to witness those. But I do like to highlight you know, the story of in, in the forests that were highly affected by climate change, where I spent, you know, years researching, there were still, there were still trees surviving. And there was, you know, a story of regrowth and other populations um, growing into the, the space where these trees uh, had been impacted and had been, had been dying. Um, so there's a story of loss that you can focus on, but there's also one of regrowth. And I think part of the adaptation story for people will be you know, where, how do we deal with the negative impacts? And also how do we find ways to um, embrace the opportunities this creates and in the innovation? Yeah, that's such an awesome way to bring it all together in terms of the research and starting point that you had and tying it back to what we can each do individually, but not forgetting again, the importance of making it a priority for the institutions and companies and governments that we are all sort of beholden to. So it's um, really helpful and I think impactful to hear that developed, evolved perspective that you bring. And uh, it's awesome also to see that you are taking a lot of time to think about how do I get these messages out to more people and um, share the insight that you're leading to get people at their own starting point so that they can begin their journey and do great work as well. Thank you. Well, I do believe it's going to take all of us. And uh, I mean, I think that's the other point I'd like to make is that I think we've separated climate action out in some extent. It's like this, this genre of action when really climate action needs to um, infiltrate and integrate into everything we're doing across all levels. Um, and again, that points to the canary and, and our, own, our own individual efficacy and how you can incorporate it into your life. Because I think in the same way that we think about public health as a constant you know, concern or worthy of investment, like we need, to, we need to put climate change on that same platform at the same level of, of attention and care. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. So hopefully everybody can be inspired to find their own canaries <laughs> and turn that into, uh, you know, actionable changes and work that we can apply to climate justice. So thank you so much, Lauren, for sharing all your insight and being so generous with the findings that you've come across over the course of your career. Excited to see your future work. Thank you so much for having me and thank you again for putting this series together.